What's up guys, it's Bromley. I got a question for you. Imagine that you're charged with running the most in-depth study that the field of sports science has ever seen. Imagine that you can pick as many people as you want, have them train for as long as you want and control for as many different variables as you want. So in this study, the only caveat is that you have to pick who your population of lifters is going to be. Is it going to be world champions or is it going to be mediocre lifters? In this scenario, I would pick the mediocre lifters and I'm going to explain why right now. Now real quick, we have some good news. The Patreon has been killing it. Your guys support over there is what allows me to do this here. We already have several exclusive videos up there. And if you want any of your questions turned into a full fledged YouTube video, that is where I'm going to harvest those questions from. So go ahead and sign up, get active on that community and we'll keep doing big things. I appreciate everybody's support. Also base strength is on sale. We got a deep discount. It's going for $9.99 right now. I appreciate everybody that ordered it early when it was more expensive. Again, that support allows me to do this. So I already have a few small projects that are going to be up in a couple months. So look out for those. So let's start off with a story because it's best explained in a story. So in World War II, the military was trying to collect data from downed bomber planes and they wanted to figure out what the most vulnerable structures were so that they could reinforce them and have a lower casualty rate out in the field. So some scientists were charged with collecting that data and finding the most vulnerable parts on the plane. Any of you plane buffs, this is not the actual data, but it proves a point. So as the scientists figured out where the bullet holes tended to be on the planes that they had available to study, the military's instinct was to reinforce those places. It stood to reason, if these are the areas that get chewed up the most, if you reinforce them with more armor, they're less likely to get chewed up, which means you're gonna have less planes go down. Now, the scientists that were collecting this data understood something very important, and that is that the only planes they had available to collect this data from were the ones that made it back to base in the first place. So actually the correct answer when it came to where to reinforce your bomber planes was just the opposite of what the military thought. It was actually reinforcing the places that did not get hit out of the sample size that you had access to. So the rationale is that all of the planes that didn't make it back got hit in the most vulnerable places. So that out of the sample of survivors, if you took a hit maybe to the engine, maybe the propellers or the cockpit, maybe the tail, that those would be essentially kill shots and those planes would be lost forever. So even though this seems fairly obvious, a lot of us still tend to make this fallacy all the time because we're often trying to find best practices by looking to the people who have already made it to the top. You can probably think in terms of weightlifting, times where you've done the same thing. You've probably collected programs from some former world champions. You've probably evaluated Olympic lifting data. These are all pieces of information that we say well, it got so-and-so to such a high position, it must be valuable. It must be the way to train, or there must be some foundationally good stuff in there. Now, there's an assumption that comes with evaluating data this way, and that the thing that gets you from point A to point B is ultimately training. Now, human beings are very trainable in a lot of ways, but we're also not. And some of those ways that we're not trainable is really important. Think of Olympic lifting data, for example. The pool of people that were studied in the realm of Olympic weightlifting were pre-selected out of the general population for their innate talent for Olympic lifting. Out of that pool, the data that was collected came from the people who thrived out of that pool. So you had several steps of selection that filtered out the most prime candidates to be successful in Olympic lifting, and then we collected data from them to figure out what the best practices were. This is exactly what Prolipin's chart was. So it begs a question, did they get so good because of the sets and reps that they did or the system of lifting that they followed? Or was it that this group of people were the most well-selected out of the available talent pool that they had? And that's a hard question to answer. And it also creates kind of a paradox because if you can't trust looking up at the most successful lifters as examples of what to do, then what are you left with? Like the worst examples? So ultimately there's kind of a truism. I mean, we always know, we always have to have in the back of our mind that the things that get somebody to the top are very well gonna be a lot of the things they did right with regards to training and planning and preparing, but it's also going to be a lot of intangibles. Now we like strength sports because it is one of the most trainable fields that you can get into. When it comes to athletic endeavors, a lot of power sports, anything that involves running fast or jumping high, there's an inherent cap that everybody has and there's not gonna be a lot you can do to get beyond that if you weren't born with a certain tool set. With strength, you can always gain more muscle and you can get a lot of leeway out of 
getting your nervous system conditioned, refining technique, and so on. So it's a lot more trainable than other fields. That being said, being the best in your weight class or the best in your chosen sport still comes down to things like how big your frame is, where your tendons insert, are you more fast twitch or slow twitch, how efficiently does your nervous system operate, what are your limb proportions like. The big one that made me think of survivor bias is how durable you are. This is one that not a lot of people talk about and I think it is extremely important to keep in mind when we are trying to consider what best practices are, especially when we're looking at the, the highest level performers. It's easy to imagine because there have been systems that have done this where some of the systems that push people the farthest might also break the least equipped to handle the stress. Weightlifting is very degenerative and if the limiting factor is how durable you are when it comes to turning out world champions, it very well may be that a lot of the best approaches are also the ones with the highest likelihood of eating you up. That selection bias might show that the people that didn't make it could have very well been very successful lifters if only they had worked under a system that took into account their individual needs and did not try to push them so hard so often. But to my knowledge, there's been no study that's attempted to parse out differences between like lifters and figure out if there's different training protocols that might be more appropriate for one versus the other. Off the top of my head, there's already a hundred variations I could think of that might be applicable. Again, going back to things like tendon insertion and limb proportions. Just by the way you're built is going to have vast implications for how stressful a given lift is for you. And that might affect how well you can recover, which might affect things like frequency and volume and intensity. But beyond that, what about the question of durability? What if one of the limiting factors of your lifters is actually how much stress they can handle without getting over use issues or tears or joint problems. It makes me think of all the Bulgarian lifters who were selected because they had a predisposition for that sport, but simply could not handle the beat down of hitting those maxes on a daily basis. Certainly that talent could have been realized if a different method of training was applied. Now, if you are a Soviet team, lifters were disposable. You only had to concern yourself with getting a certain number of world champions. You didn't have to make every single lifter realize their truest and fullest potential. So when lifters are disposable, you can get away with some things. But the thing is, you are not part of a disposable group of lifters. Your goal is to do everything you can in your power to do what works for you. And that means being realistic about what your recovery capabilities are. In addition to that, you have to be realistic about what things you can and can't get away with in training. What's the likelihood of injuries, sprains, tears? How much benefit are you really getting out of all of the extra manic work you're doing? These are important things to ask. And when you're constantly looking at the highest level performers to see what it is that they're doing, understand that survivorship bias is very real and that you are looking at a select group of people who by virtue of how good they are, probably are dealing with a set of skills that you don't have and can't potentially train for. So it's very important to keep that in mind. Now that does not mean that we should just take our ball and go home. That just means we have to be smarter and we have to understand that we don't yet have the data, we don't yet have the information that is going to answer the question of what our specific needs are. Now to get to the question that I asked in the beginning of the video, would you go with the highest level performers or would you go with the mediocre athletes? One of the reasons I would go with the mediocre athletes is because you're going to get more true representation of the potential for good training over an entire population, not just those who are best cut out to respond to that type of training. And that is the most important. And old truism is actually, if you wanna find the best coach, find a mediocre lifter who worked really hard to get good because those people will understand subtleties about the necessity of a good training program that are going to go over the head of somebody else. For those of you that follow a lot of the characters on YouTube with regards to lifting or fitness culture or whatever, you might remember a guy named Larry Wheels getting ready for a strongman contest so many years back. Well, leading up to his debut in the realm of strongman, Larry Wheels trained with none other than world record deadlift holder and world strongest man, Half Thor Bjornsson. I had a hell of a time watching Larry train with Half Thor because it was very obvious that Half Thor was good at strongman because he was six foot nine and weighed over 400 pounds. Watching the mountain of a man try to explain to a complete newbie how to get a log up to his chest or how to load a stone made it very evident that a lot of these things just kind of came together for him. And that helps out when you're built like a freaking rhinoceros. It was kind of obvious that when he was talking to somebody that didn't possess the same skill set he had, that didn't have the same sheer mass, that didn't have the same height, and that didn't automatically have the years in the sport, that he was at a loss for how to make these things click. And the reason is Half Thor is a survivor. He's an example of one that made it to the, the place we're all trying to go. 
He started out with a skill set that none of us have. So a lot of the specific things that got him where he went are specific to him or they're arbitrary. At the end of the day, when you can hold 400 pounds of mass and still look like a physique competitor, you're carrying some tools that other people aren't. So you have to ask yourself how important it is to do things the way that he did it. Now we can also see this principle at play when we look at some of the charlatans that operate around the world of athletic training. Joel Seedman comes to mind. A lot of these guys realize how powerful gimmicky bullshit is as a marketing device. They quickly find their way into working with a couple of pro athletes and they lean on the genetic predispositions of these athletes to mask their shitty training practices. This is something that's pretty well known in the field. You'll see a lot of guys operate in the field of athletic training that if you listen to them talk or if you watch them train, obviously don't have a good handle on what they're doing. They have fallen into these tropes of doing a lot of gimmicky stuff that looks functional or athletic, and then they will cite the performance of their athletes in the field. Well, once again, if we are holding ourselves accountable, the way you would establish any one of those methods is working is if your athletes maybe tended to perform better than all of the other equally gifted athletes, or if maybe you did some type of study that compared results, but you don't have that. You simply have, I'm training this guy, he's an NFL player, therefore my training method is on the level of NFL players, and that is the ultimate bias. It doesn't make any logical sense, and people fall for it left and right. I constantly hear how Westside is used heavily in athletic programs, in football programs, at universities, or in the NFL. So it begs the question, uh, are those athletes being rewarded for hitting a one rep max board press? Are those athletes then outperforming other athletes who train under different systems? When you are taking these systems and applying it to a group of people who are already the best pre-selected responders, what is the empirical reasoning? What is the common sense reasoning? for why we should think that system is superior to anything else, especially when it's being applied to a group of people who are not directly rewarded for meeting these goals. It doesn't matter if a pro football player deadlifts 800 pounds. It matters that they're explosive as shit, can move well, can recover, and that they know the game. So it begs that question. But I've seen guys like Joel Seedman constantly lean on the pro athletes he trains when you realize that there's tens of thousands of pro athletes in the United States and they all train with somebody, it doesn't mean that each one is like the next best thing. So when they're putting out books dealing with, you know, this banded offset bullshit or this unilateral bullshit, it's all bullshit. The fact is these guys were pre-selected to be the best. That's survivorship bias. So keep that in mind. So the next time you're looking to your favorite lifter or when you're trying to take uh, inspiration from the people that represent the cream of the crop, understand that they're working with a lot of tools that you can't directly see, that there are skill sets, there's talents, there's things you can't train for that are going to heavily skew how methods work in different circumstances. So if you want to know what works the best, you have to find the people who are disadvantaged. You have to find the people who are not the best example of what a good lifter is or what a good athlete is. And you have to figure out what they did to get competitive and to hang with others. In that realm, in that layer of human development, that's where you're gonna find the gold, that's where you're gonna find the stuff that works for everybody. Okay, so don't get caught up in the gimmicky stuff, don't get caught up in the bullshit. Let me know what you guys think. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, this is Bromley, I'll see ya.